This is going to be a video about covalent bonds and ionic bonds. And the reason why we have to talk about these two different types is that it actually leads into the proper naming of each of these bonding types. Because each of these bonding types have their own separate rules of naming the molecules and compounds, it is very important for you to identify which bond type it is, then use those rules to name the, the bond. And in order to begin about your covalent and ionic bonding, we have to go back to your periodic table and look at the two major types of elements that are found because that's how you're going to identify the type of bonding. So let's look at some of the basics. So periodic table basics is that um, the periodic table is actually split into two basic types of elements. You have your metals and you have your non-metals. So let me just kind of get a pen here. So you have your metals and you have your non-metals. And the metals are on the left side of the periodic table and the non-metals are on the right side of the periodic table. So what that means is that on your periodic table, it's going to be split into two, two sort of two sides. One of going to one side is going to contain all the metals. The other side is going to contain all the non-metals. And the metals and non-metals are actually separated by the staircase. This staircase is going to be the separation point, and the elements along the staircase are known as the metalloids, and they have properties of both metals and non-metals. So if you want to take a second to pause the video, copy this down into your notebook and um, take out your periodic table after because we're going to have to, we're going to label your periodic table so here's the periodic table listing the metals and non-metals you can see that all the ones in gray so all the ones on the left side of the periodic table these ones are going to be your metals and anything that's on, on the right side of of the periodic table these ones are your non-metals so where's the staircase that we were talking about this is going to be your staircase. So this is going to be your staircase. And we can see that these ones, this is metalloid, 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 metalloid. These ones, all those elements are your metalloids. Aluminum is still considered as a metal here. Um, this is going to be your left side, which are your metals. This is going to be your right side, non-metals, anything on this staircase. So make sure you label this. Those are your metalloids. So let's look at your covalent bonding. Covalent bonding is the sharing of the electrons between atoms. So when you have a molecule, those the electrons between those atoms are shared between each other to reach a full shell. So we're going to talk about that and look at our Bohr model again. And these are the bonds that occur between two or more non-metals. So this is the very important part is that when you see a molecule or compound and you have to name it first thing you want to do is identify what kind of bond is it is it a covalent or is it an ionic and covalent one is when you look at these two elements like this example co2 carbon if you look at your periodic table carbon is in your non-metal and also your oxygen is also your non-metal right right here is carbon oxygen is right here two non-metals which will make this as a covalent bond Covalent bonds will always use prefixes when naming. We'll talk more about this next video when we're naming uh, covalent bonds, but just keep this in mind that covalent bond, this is the rule, is that they will always use prefixes. Another example is CF4. If you look at your periodic table right now, fine carbon, carbon's right here, fluorine's right here. Both of these are non-metals, which makes that both of these are your covalent molecules, covalent bond molecules. So let's look at this. In carbon, carbon has how many electrons? So let's go back to our periodic table. It's right here. It has one, uh, has the atomic number six, so it has six electrons. This one has six electrons, so then we're going to draw the Bohr model for carbon. So here's my nucleus, first ring, and then here's my second ring. That's my carbon. Let me just get a different color here. These are going to represent my electrons. So I have six electrons I need to fill out. So I'm going to have first two here. That's my maximum. And I'm going to have one, two, three, four. That means I have four valence electrons on the outside shell. How many electrons does this full shell, uh, can? how many can it take? It can take a maximum of eight. So it needs to reach eight electrons. So how are we going to do that? Well, let's look at my oxygen here's my carbon so let's look at my oxygen here let's draw one here so this is my oxygen 
So here's my ring and my ring. I should know how many electrons I have. Oxygen has how many electrons? Look back at my periodic table and I have oxygen right here has the atomic number eight. That means it has eight electrons. So let's write this. It has eight electrons. I need to fill the eight electrons in my Bohr model. So I have the first two in the first shell and then one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That means I have two empty slots in this outer shell. So since I have in this chemical formula it says I have CO2, that means that I have two of these. So I'm just going to paste another one here, right here. So what does that mean? What that means is that these electrons are actually going to be shared. So you can see, well, where, where is this oxygen going to get the two electrons? Well, look at carbon. It has four electrons outside the shell. This is going to share with this one, and they're going to come and share with that one. And then this one is going to share over there too with this one. So they're going to share. So this, this one is going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, because we gained these two from the sharing. So this is happy because it has eight electrons. Well, what about this oxygen? Well, it has six right now. You can see that this is going to share here, that they're going to share. And then also this is also going to share as well. So then you're going to look at, well, this oxygen is going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight from sharing of these carbon electrons. So this is happy because it has eight valence electrons, eight valence electrons. Well, what about carbon? Carbon has one, two, three, four of its own, but now it's going to gain two from this one from the sharing from this oxygen and two from this one. So that has eight valence electrons. So that means that all three of these are happy. That means that they're very stable and you cannot break it apart. This is your covalent bonding. Another example here is carbon F4. This is carbon tetrafluoride. So again, carbon has six electrons. How many does fluorine have? I think it has nine. So this is fluorine should have nine here. So there's eight, nine, ten. So this is going to have nine electrons. So let's draw the Bohr model. First, we're going to draw carbon right here. So this is my carbon, my first ring similar to the last one second ring it's going to have one two three four five six and then for the fluorine I'm going to have nine electrons so I'm going to draw fluorine here so here's my nucleus fluorine I need to fill nine electrons so here's one two and then here's this one let's see how many how this works so let's see if this is enough first do one two oh that's not my that's my nucleus one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Okay, so I don't take this one into account. So there's nine electrons right now. That means that this lonely one here, that means there's one that can be put right there. Well, where is that going to get that from? You can see that that's the carbon. So even if I were to do this to show the sharing, this is going to see. This is what's going to happen. That's sharing right there well I have three extra carbons here how about I do this and then I'm gonna put this one here let's see if I can rotate this one um, let's move this one oh this one here and then this one over there like that right and then I'll just erase this one oh and that's how you do it so that's two right here and then you can see that I'm going to have more of these ones. So here's another one. Oh, let me do this one right here. And then finally, I have another one that's right here. Okay, so this is how you get your carbon uh, tetrafluoride because these electrons are being shared. So I'm just going to do this to show you what this really means. So this is eight valence electrons are all eight of them carbon has one two three four five six seven eight they're all going to be pretty happy because it's stable that's covalent bonding let's look at ionic bonding now ionic bonding is actually a lot simpler than covalent bonding because it's the transfer of the electrons from one atom to the other these are bonds between one metal and one or more non-metal so this one is one of each 
So if you look at the example NaCl, very common table salt, look at your periodic table. Where is Na? Na is right here on the left side in the metal side. Where is chlorine? Chlorine is the atomic number 17 all the way over here. So you can see I have one here on the left side, one on the right side. That's an ionic bond. What's the next example that we have? K2O, potassium oxide. So if we look at this, where is potassium? Potassium is just underneath sodium, it's right here, and oxide is oxygen is right here. Another non-metal and a metal makes this an ionic bond. So let's look at how we name these ionic bonds. Is that one major difference from covalent bonds is that ionic bonds never use prefixes. When you're going to get into this, you're going to realize that ionic bonds or ion, uh, compounds are so much easier because you don't have to worry about prefixes. So let's look at the Bohr model of this. Sodium has, Na has 11 electrons. So check out your periodic table. Chlorine has, I believe, 35 electrons. If we were to draw all these electrons, you're going to notice that for sodium, you're going to have one valence electron that's left. So that's one, two, I'm going to use this one, I'll draw a nucleus here, one, two, boom, 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 boom. So that's 10 and 11. Chlorine, here's my nucleus, and then let me just kind of keep the colors consistent. Here's my first ring, second ring, and then the third ring. So you're going to see that I have, oh, I think chlorine has 17 electrons, what I'm talking about. 35 is the atomic mass. So, but sorry about that. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. That means I have one extra slot because I need to fill this to 8. This sodium has 11, has one extra. How does this work? Well, it's just like a puzzle. This one has one extra one. This one needs one. Let's be friends. Boom. Transfer this electron over. That means that this is going to be gone. This has a full shell here with eight. This one's going to gain that electron right here. It's going to have eight electrons. Both of these are super happy because they're stable. That's how sodium chloride works. The next example, K2O. So let's look, let's look at potassium. What's the atomic number for potassium? Potassium is number 19, so it has 19 electrons. At this point, maybe you can see that potassium actually has has 19 electrons but has one valence electron why is valence electron so useful because whenever we look at bonding we actually don't care about what's inside the atoms we only care about what's on the outside shell because this is the only electron that can be moved right so if we were to look at here's my Bohr model of potassium I don't even have to fill all this stuff in because I know at the end of this entire ring I have one valence electron and that's the only electron that's going to be doing anything because that's the one that's going to be moving around. So I'm going to have one electron here. All these ones pre previous to this are going to be full. Let's look at my oxygen. Oxygen has eight electrons. And let's look at how many valence electrons does it have. How do we figure out how many valence electrons? Look at the group, right? This one, look at the family. This is one, family two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That means oxygen is right here. Everything in this group, this family, will have six valence electrons. So let's go and use the six valence electrons. Simple as that. So I'm going to do my nucleus. This is my oxygen. Boom, boom. I know that this is going to have six valence electrons, so I don't even care what's in the middle. I just know that one, two, three, four, five six i did this because i want to show that there's an empty slot beside this pairing an empty slot beside this pairing so where is this going to get this oxygen going to get the electron from well it's going to get it from its friend his friend potassium boom potassium loses this electron because we know that if this electron is gone everything before is going to be full right that's what we figured out we just did a shortcut here and then where is this one going to go get the next electron well, look at the chemical formula. It says K2O. That means that you're going to have two potassium. So if I were to go and highlight all these, let's see if this works. Move all this stuff over here. Oh, move all this stuff over here. And take out the arrow. That electron that's lonely beside potassium is going to go here. 
Boom. That means that this oxygen is going to have one, two, three, four, five, six. The new one that's gain. Seven, gain, eight, gain. That means that's happy. Potassium lost that one on the outside shell. So everything in the that's in the inner one is full. That's happy too because it's stable. Same for this one. That's your ionic bond. So summary, ionic bonds between a non-metal and a metal. Covalent bonds between two non-metals. So that's your two different types. Thanks for listening.